Okay, thank you, Tony. It's nice to be here again. Uh, I got a lot of slides, so I'm going to try to go pretty fast and make a fairly speedy coverage of a little survey of the field and then settle down on a, a couple of more specific areas. But the arc will take us uh, not towards the giant detectors, which Tony was just mentioning, but in fact, at the other extreme, where in the end I'll tell you a little bit about the world's smallest neutrino detector that we're building. So the talk today is not going to be about this, uh, talking to the neighbors. This, this is Tony's fault, this cartoon here. He was talking to some press guy about some crazy papers we wrote about neutrino communications, and the guy wrote an article and got it into uh, The Economist. But it's kind of frustrating. You know, you, d you try to do good physics research and so on, and then you write some crazy papers, and they're the ones that get the publicity, not the, not the serious stuff. So here's my introductory cartoon. This is when we had in Hawaii uh, the local newscaster reading something about neutrinos, and he said, neutrinos, that was some sort of breakfast cereal, huh? So one of my students drew this cartoon. And I calculated that the, the contents of that box in relic neutrinos would be about 210 to the minus 18th kilocalories. So it's really low diet stuff. OK, this is the usual introductory picture of uh, the, char the up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom uh, quarks and the leptons, e, mu, and tau, and the neutrinos, the three familiar families or flavors. And I'll tell you about some possibilities. There could be some more sterile neutrinos out here. And the peculiar thing about neutrinos that everybody here knows that they only partake of interacting with the W and Z force carriers. And of course, all of these interact with uh, gravitons, if there are gravitons. Or, but of course, gravitons interact in a different way because they know the total mass energy and not just the rest mass. So where do neutrinos come from? This is the tally of all the sources we know of neutrinos. Of course, everybody here knows nuclear reactors and power stations and so on. And uh, those are new E bars. We'll come back to that in a bit. Anti-electron neutrinos uh, almost exclusively, well, or ex well, the negligible of any other sort of neutrino. Particle accelerators, for instance, from Fermilab and uh, accelerators in Japan and Europe, uh, by slamming a beam of protons into a target and letting the secondaries decay, you can produce a fairly high energy beam of neutrinos. From the Earth's atmosphere, have been one of the most useful sources of neutrinos, which we've studied heavily with the cosmic rays hitting the top of the atmosphere, making pions and kaons and those particles decaying sometimes, uh, giving us a rain of neutrinos coming down and coming up, which we've studied heavily, more about that. And relatively recently, we've detected neutrinos for the first time from the bulk of the Earth. People have long, for a long while, talked about trying to detect the neutrinos from all the radioactive decays in the Earth. And there's quite a breeze blowing right up through us here from all the uranium, thorium, and other radioactive element chains in the Earth. And we finally detected that in the last five years. <coughs> from the sun, uh, starting back in the 60s, I'll say more about that. Uh, from supernovae, at least the gravitational stellar collapse variety, when an uh, star collapses to a neutron star or a black hole and emits a terrific burst of neutrinos. We unfortunately have only one example of that, supernova 1987A, which is the beginning and end of neutrino astronomy from beyond the solar system. It's the whole history of neutrino astronomy <laughs> and that one few second event. Uh, from astrophysical sources, I'll mention uh, a few of those, but we have not detected any of the hypothesized astrophysical sources as yet. And of course, we all believe from the Big Bang that they are right here, but uh, nobody knows how to detect them yet. Um, I started to make a list when I started writing this talk about what do we know well about neutrinos. And I thought it'd be just a couple of lines. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, gee, there's actually this whole list. Uh, so everybody knows they have no electric charge, little or, or no electric ma or magnetic dipole mode. Uh, essentially, they're point particles. 
very small mass compared to the other fermions, but they do have some mass, as we'll talk more about. They participate only in the standard model weak interaction, as far as we know, which is to a fair level, but there's room for hanky-panky. They fall under gravity, surprisingly we know that from supernova 1987A because they didn't take a shortcut or take a long cut. They came at about the same speed as the photons from the supernova going a little bit closer to the center of the galaxy. Um, they're produced in only the left-handed helicity state and the antineutrinos the other way around. Uh, and nobody knows why. They come in three flavors, as do the quarks and the charged leptons. Lepton number is conserved. We used to think that uh, lepton flavor was conserved as well, but we know now that lepton flavor is not conserved, but leptonness uh, is conserved, as far as we know. That, as far as we know, goes with any of these statements, right? Uh, no known lifetime, but the lifetime limits are not terribly constraining, um, simply because you can't keep a neutrino around very long to check on its lifetime, but you don't see radiative decays coming from across the universe and so on. Uh, if the neutrino is to decay, it has to have something to decay to, and it's not obvious what that could be, but uh, theoreticians are creative, so there's, we, they can always do something. The mass state's relative phases change with flight time, which is what produces what is called oscillations, simply because the quantum uh, wave functions get slightly out of phase with each other and Waré kind of pattern takes place and you get this oscillations. And as I'll reiterate, uh, three mass states of neutrinos suffice to explain all of the normal data that we have with a couple of interesting exceptions which we'll talk more about, which might be the elephant's nose under the tent for something, a fairly big deal. So uh, then I thought, well, let's make a list of unanswered neutrino questions. These would be the known unknowns in the terms of our former Secretary of Defense. Uh, uh, the obvious one is who needed them anyway until we have a grand unified theory and so on. We won't understand why the devil we actually did need neutrinos. It turns out they do lots of things. We know what they do, but we don't know how they fit in. But that's part of the general problem for a gut. Uh, why are the masses so small? We certainly don't know that. Uh, what is the absolute mass scale? Emphasize that what we measure with oscillations is mass differences, and we know uh, two mass differences, but we don't know where to hang the whole uh, structure of the masses. It, the bottom one could, in fact, be absolutely zero, and we wouldn't know the difference at this point. Um, and why is the mixing matrix so different from quarks? Uh, you might say, yeah, so why not? <laughs> Since we don't know why the mixing matrix of the quarks is the way that it is either. And what is, we'll talk more about this, this corner mixing element, which is between the electrons in the third mass state, theta called theta one three. What, how big is that, or is it flat zero? If it's flat zero, we don't get to see any CP violation with the neutrinos. Are there heavy scale right-handed neutrinos, which is the easy way out for the missing right-handed neutrinos, is that they are somehow seesawed up to gut scale 10 to the 15th jev or something like that, uh, but we don't know. and. Uh, uh, of course, people can play games with the heavy right-handed neutrinos having CP violation as a way to get leptogenesis. Um, are there, we'll deal with this a little bit more, are there light sterile neutrinos? There is room to drive a fairly big truck into the modeling of neutrinos as yet. We have a lot numbers that are consistent with various things, but there's a lot of room for uh, people to have fun making different theories. Uh, what role do neutrinos play? This is kind of a different story in heavy element production in supernova. It's just to mention that if you uh, have a talk from someone who's dealing with the question of how the heavy elements got generated in supernovae in the neutron bath after the supernova explosion, there have been problems all along in getting the numbers right and in, in getting the uh, R process 
uh, abundance is correct. And neutrinos are almost surely involved in that in a way that is not yet understood. So uh, I like to tweak my theoretical friends that we have no guidance from a unified theory in this business. And in fact, most of the prior guesses and biases and so on in the neutrino business were wrong because the standard model had conveniently neutrino masses at zero because why have them at something else? No obvious reason. And also everybody loved, you ask, 15 years ago, you ask what will the mixing angles be? People will say, well, I don't know. Maybe the Kabibo angle. Why not? It's the only angle we know. <laughs> so, but it wasn't the Kabibo angle. The mixing uh, angle for the muon neutrinos, as it turns out, is as big as it can be. So it's been an experimentalist game in this. This was just to make the point about the terrific difference, the generations one, two, three, and the mass scale here. These are five powers of 10, that the neutrino masses are somewhere in here, and the uh, charge fermions of the building blocks are in here, and there's about 10 orders of magnitude difference in the masses, and it's not obvious why. And this was just to put in, punch up the fact about uh, leptogenesis being pretty much the only game in town for discussing how we get the excess of matter over any matter. Right, Arena? <laughs> uh, and uh, how do neutrinos fit in in the total mass energy of the universe actually? Uh, oh yeah, I always like to point out to people, it's Cop Copernicus to the nth power these days, of course, that we find that the stuff of which we're made is such a tiny fraction of the total universe. And this, this actually is an older slide. I think this is 1.0 plus or minus 0 0.02 these days from the, from the most recent uh, uh, measurements from the, what's the satellite, damn it? Uh, WMAP, WMAP. And uh, so dark energy about 70 and matter about 30% or 25. And neutrinos somewhere down in here. Not a, not a big enough factor to be able to explain the dark matter content, the missing dark matter, but not totally negligible either. This is just to point out where we've seen neutrinos, natural neutrinos across the uh, a scale of energy from 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the 18th EVs. 24 powers of 10, we haven't seen anything down in here. Nobody knows of a good way to uh, get at these Big Bang neutrinos unless our friend Ben here has some trick with the radio business they're playing. Um, we've seen solar neutrinos. We've seen one burst from supernova. Uh, terrestrial anti-neutrinos we've seen. Reactor anti-neutrinos we've seen. Uh, background from the sum of all old supernovae we have not yet seen, uh, but we seem to be not far from that. We've seen plenty of atmospheric neutrinos, and we haven't seen any neutrinos from the most powerful astrophysical objects like AGNs, active galactic nuclei, and uh, perhaps from jets, from uh, gamma ray bursts. And from the end of the cosmic ray spectrum, this is one place there have to be neutrinos here because we, well, there's a lot, bit of a long discussion, but there seems to be a cutoff in the end of the cosmic ray spectrum that's due to the cosmic rays interacting with the background photons in the universe. And from that interaction, there are pies which will decay to neutrinos, and those neutrinos pretty much have to be there unless you're going to start invoking things about Lorentz invariance, vari Lorentz invariance violations and so on. So some of the astrophysical neutrino sources, none of which we've seen yet, are the high and ultra high energy neutrinos, uh, such as these Berezinsky Zatzepin, or usually called GZK neutrinos that I just mentioned from the end of the cosmic ray spectrum, which should be peaking up around 10 to the 18th EV or so. There's some hint in our experiment, in the ANITA experiment, but it's really extremely dicey. We're not even sure that there's anything there. There's going to be another run of that in another year. But it's a little worrisome because we're not seeing these as yet. And all the energetic calculations and so on from earlier on, we should have been in business. The ice cube people who now have a cubic kilometer detector, it, it, it seems as though 
We've been saying it for 30 years that we ought to have been seeing those by now, and we're not seeing them. So everybody's getting kind of nervous and starting to think of theoreticians a chance to be creative. If you can think of some way to kill off the neutrino cross-section at really high energies or do some violence to Mr. Lorentz or I don't know. Uh, supernova neutrinos from uh, a, a supernova in our galaxy, which happens once every 20 to 100 years. We're due, but of course, as you know in this game, that doesn't count. It means, though, that there's order of maybe uh, 100 of these spheres of neutrinos, shells coming across our galaxy, which will come in one of these days. And we got to see one from most curiously the neighboring Large Magellanic Clouds, not from our own galaxy in 1987. So there's more of these to come in, and when we see them, we may be able to learn lots of interesting things about neutrinos, as well as the supernova. Neutrinos associated with gamma ray bursts, nobody knows what the, what the machinery is driving a gamma ray burst. Uh, gamma ray bursts are awesome uh, events. The brightest things in the universe, when they're pointed at you, we see them, as you have undoubtedly heard, out to, I don't know, the farthest one, Z of at least five. I, what? 9.1. So astounding. <laughs> Way back in the early days. Um, and the question here is how much hadron loading is there in the jets that are associated with these gamma ray bursts? which seem to be associated with supernovae, uh, and much argument about that. Uh, the relic supernova neutrinos, I mentioned that. I'll show you a slide. Neutrinos from dark matter annihilations in the Earth, Sun, or galactic center, uh, subject which will be warming up a little bit again. This is called indirect dark matter detection and uh, is a good way to see the annihilation products if Dark matter is getting trapped in the sun, for example, uh, and, and is Majorana and, and annihilates with itself. But who knows? And of course, I always, oh, backing up a little bit, this is the, a plot of the calculations of the neutrinos coming in from earlier supernovae. And this is one of those known unknowns that we can, we can get close to the models that people have. And it looks like next generation of instruments, we should be there. And it's not just a nice thing to do. We can learn something if we can get the spectrum of these, because it is also a record of the Z dependence of the supernovae, if you can get it in detail. Um, and this was just a picture to illustrate the capture of the, uh, of the neutralinos or whatever in the sun. Uh, scattering around until they annihilate, producing annihilation products. And of course, our favorite would be if these things are leptophilic in their, in their decay, and it should be, uh, it should be just going to neutrino, anti-neutrino pair. That would be absolutely fantastic, and then we get to see a, a line. But more likely, it's something like uh, tau, tau bar, and there will be a lot of junk in the final state, especially if they're heavy. So this is a slide I always show in these sort of talks of how you open a new window on the universe, you expect to see one thing like uh, using telescopes for navigation and seeing the moons of Jupiter or uh, Penzias Wilson tracing down uh, noise in their, in their telescope and finding the, the three degree Kelvin background and so on. And that's always been true uh, in many, many examples of people setting off to do one thing and finding another. It included us with, uh, with Super K. And the big experiments that I've been part of, we got the money on the basis of looking for nucleon decay. We don't even have a smell of nucleon decay, but we found neutrino oscillations. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm sort of sniffling. I got a cold from going to cold and damp Madison. Um, OK, so then I tried to make a list of neutrino experimental peculiarities that I knew of. The, these, these are the unknown, the unknown unknowns. Uh, one of them that I like to bring up, this is mostly for experimentalists, is that the flux calculations 
both at accelerators and in the cosmic rays, ab initio flux calculations always under predict the flux of neutrinos uh, compared to what we see. And it goes back to the earliest experiments at Fermilab and so on, where the calculations always under predict the flux that you actually, actually find. And people have generally tried to skip around that and normalize it out and uh, get away from it, but uh, it, it remains there. The result may be boring. I'll show you why in a little bit, or it may not. Maybe there's something we've been missing been right under our noses. Supernova 1987A had some strange things. For instance, the events we found uh, all pointed a little bit better than they should have, which would, should have been not at all. They should have been the secondaries pretty much isotropic in the lab frame, but they pointed back with a 5% probability. Take another supernova to find out. Where are the very high energy neutrinos? I mentioned that already. Minos uh, experiment at Fermilab looking at neutrinos uh, in Minos in northern Minnesota looking at neutrinos from Fermilab claims some peculiarity which if it literally true would mean CPT violation. I only bring that up to say it. I think one should not take it too seriously even though it has been advocated to some committees giving extra beam time. <laughs> the, that uh, I think there's a problem there, and we find no evidence for it in Super K. And then these last items that I will dwell a bit on, LS, the LSND anomaly, which is an old story that most of us have been happy to ignore for many, many years, uh, with Nui bars appearing from a stop pion target starting way back 20 years ago. And the experiment uh, just won't go away. There's no obvious reason that it was wrong. But people say, well, hmm, we don't know until it's confirmed. Mini Boone ran at Fermilab in this last year, two years, uh, has found, we'll talk a little bit more about this, some unexplained bumps in both the neutrino and the anti-neutrino runs and not in the same place, which is very strange. Um, and then uh, there's a revised reactor neutrino flux uh, calculation done by our French colleagues who are real experts at this sort of thing. And I'll tell you that they're finding that the predictions of the past for the neutrino flux from reactors are off with the implication for the rate being about 6% shifted. And uh, that could be one of those elephants nose under the tent sort of things, as you'll soon see. Um, Along with this, the solar gallium experiments uh, were calibrated using radioactive sources, very powerful radioactive sources, and in four trials with very big er error bars. They all came out a little low, which goes in the same direction as the, the French claim. Uh, moreover, there's you've probably heard cosmology talks lately where uh, in fitting up the CMB, there is a tendency to uh, want to allow for one or two st uh, sterile neutrinos. So the quick historical tour, I don't think there are many graduate students that really need this here. I'll go very fast. So neutrinos proposed in the 30s, but then thought to be undetectable. Rhinus and company detected them in the 50s. This I do want to emphasize a little bit. The main signature for detecting electron antineutrinos is the same as it was for Rhinus and company way back when. A new E bar off a proton, basically a neutrino stealing a charge, becoming a positron. The positron comes to rest fairly quickly and then annihilates. And the neutron wanders around for a little while and then gets captured, depending on what the sauce is that you are working with. In their case, it was uh, cadmium, but it could be uh, just protons to make deuterium. And then you see a signal from that. So the signature is bam, bam, the two, the two flashes of light in, the, in this scintillating medium being close in time, a few microseconds, and close in space, no more than about a meter or so apart. Uh, and the second one of a known amount of light. So it's a very great signature for separating off that, uh, that interaction. Uh, whoops. 
This thing's got a mind of its own. That interaction from backgrounds. The first natural cosmic ray neutrinos were detected by Rhinus and company in 65 and also uh, Kolar Goldfields people at about the same time. The 60s were very active and then the late 60s, Ray Davis and company started up the first solar neutrino experiment in uh, the Homestake mine, which is the same place. That same cavity now has been renovated and will be used for new experiments in the uh, Dusel Deep Underground Science and Engineering Lab. And the signature there, these are radiochemical experiments. So looking for chlorine being turned into argon, and the argon-37 is radioactive, so you manage to filter out the few atoms a day that are produced and count those. An amazing technology. Not much happened in the 70s, the 80s. Uh, the solar neutrino experiments were getting more funny results, hard to reconcile with each other. Uh, the underground cosmic ray neutrino detectors uh, were starting to get some strange results in the cosmic ray muon fluxes where there was a peculiar ratio of muon to electron neutrinos and we had big fights about what was going on uh, and we had at one time I used to have a slide with about a dozen different solutions to the problem one of which was oscillations uh, but there were lots of other possibilities then. Um, but then, of course, there was the one big highlight in the late 80s, which was the signal from supernova 1987A, which was seen in two, maybe three experiments, and many stories to tell about that. But that's th there is the whole of neutrino astronomy on that one slide. <laughs> so in the 90s, things really picked up. Uh, Kamikanda experiment in Japan, the old Kamikanda uh, experiment, uh, was the first to detect the elastic scattering of neutrino, electron neutrinos from electrons in, and they point because the mass of the electron is small enough that it gets kicked forward and you look at the angular distribution of these and it says indeed it's coming from the sun. Up until that point we didn't know for sure we were seeing any neutrinos from the sun because the radiochemical experiments just integrate the total and you have to know that there's not some other source. And uh, I'll say more about the four different experiments, but they all were getting funny numbers. And there was the LSND experiment that I mentioned already, and more about that. And then in 1996, Super K turned on, and this is what we should have seen in general with the cosmic ray atmospheric, the neutrinos made in the atmosphere from the cosmic rays, twice as many muon neutrinos as electron neutrinos, both coming down and coming up. And that's sort of Gauss's law. It's just by symmetry. The numbers in the opposite direction should be the same. And in fact, what we saw was this, that they seemed to be pretty much all right coming down, but coming up, half the muon neutrinos had gotten lost. That's the quick tour. This was what we, uh, this was what we published in the first paper in 98 which has gone on to be the, I always have to be careful to say this, the most cited paper in the history of experimental particle physicists because our theoretical friends are more busy citing themselves and each other. <laughs> so we have to kick them out of the citation list to show on the scale. Um, but this paper showed with a tremendous number of standard deviations that there was something really wrong with the muon neutrinos and not with the electron neutrinos. Up until that point, we didn't know whether it was muons and electrons that were causing trouble, but we saw that it was the electrons were okay, muon neutrinos are doing something strange, presumably mixing nu mu nu tau. A few years later, the snow experiment up in Canada came online, which I'm sure you've all heard a talk about one time or another, but they were able to measure three different processes from the solar neutrinos now, jumping scales, down to a few MeV, uh, five to around 10 MeV. And they measure these different proce processes, the electron scattering, the charge current, and most importantly, the neutral current. And when you plot the results of these three measurements on this plot here, which has the correct sum for each of these processes, they cross at one point so beautifully, it looks almost phony that, that it, it was so good so be it. That's what it came out to be. And what that tells you is that the neutrinos are still here coming through us from the sun, 
about two-thirds of them are changed into not electron neutrinos anymore, presumably mu and tau neutrinos. And this is what the sum of the solar neutrino business looked like over the years and why people were confused. Should have seen this, saw this, should have seen this, saw this, should have seen this, saw this. And then the neutral current result saying, ha, the neutrinos are there, they're just changing their stripes. And so that throws out a bunch of models having to do with new, uh, neutrino decay and so on. Then another major experiment, the Camland experiment in Japan, measuring in the early 2000s, neutrinos, electron antineutrinos coming from reactors around Japan. The uh, previous experiments at various distances, 10 meters, 100 meters, kilometer, 100 kilometers, these earlier experiments getting just about expectations and uh, Camland seeing a significant deficit. Look here in the spectrum. This is after a few years running. The expected number with no oscillations, with oscillations. If you interpret that in terms of L over E, which if you had a beam coming from just one p place and knew the energies would be a pure cosine wave, would which would look like this, but it's convolved over a number of sources, so it's smeared out. Here are the close-in experiments. So it starts here, and then it's coming back up, down, and back up again. So we're seeing clear evidence that it's oscillations. There's no, no trickery with the spin flips or any other craziness. Uh, it's really oscillations. And it's consistent between neutrinos and antineutrinos between from the sun and from the reactors. So the picture that we have is of the three mass eigenstates. We know the ordering of two of them from the solar neutrinos, uh, but we don't know whether this guy goes here or here. Uh, and we know that these two mass differences are separated by about a factor of 30. Why? Who knows? And that the mixings are pretty large. The mixing matrix picture looks like this. You can break this up in different ways, but this is the this is the uh, MNSP matrix, as it's often being called. Uh, and you see that the elements are all pretty large, except for this corner one, which is this theta 1, 3 that people are desperately looking for right now. And it's completely different than the CKM matrix, which is, of course, peaked along the diagonal and very small in the corners. And this is the summary of the uh, data on three neutrino mixing as it stands now. This uh, hasn't changed much in the last two years. And one thing that's pretty amazing here is that here is the mix, the delta m squared, the mass difference squared. And you see that we're down to about 10% in getting this for the electron uh, antineutrinos. Uh, and you know this is something we didn't even know existed, that neutrinos had mass and so on. We're down getting 10% of the mass difference squared after 10 years or so. So we've made a lot of progress. Not sure what we're progressing towards, because there's no model that can, we can use that good precision with yet. Uh, and this is for the, so essentially this is the solar mixing angle, and this is the atmospheric neutrino mixing angle. And this is that theta 1, 3 which we only have upper limits on. And this is what all the fuss about the theta 1, 3 measurements is about. A guy by the name of Michaelian proposed in 2000 that if you use the survival probability function for the electron antineutrinos uh, as they fly away from a reactor, you don't involve the CP violating term. So what you measure when you measure those oscillations <coughs> will be purely the uh, purely the term that has the theta 1, 3 in it. So this is the major oscillation, the theta 1, 2 driven term here with a, a, a period that's about for the main energy of, from a reactor uh, about 110 kilometers or maximum dip at 55 kilometers. But the first dip for the theta 1, 3 is going to be out at about two kilometers or so. So depending on how big it is, if you measure the ratio of the flux up close to out at about two kilometers, you can get a handle on this. But we don't know where this goes quite 
precisely yet, and we certainly don't know this very well. We only have an upper limit. So the game is to use two detectors to measure that, and it's, it's a very tough business. There are three main competitors, Double Show in France, Daya Bay in China, and Reno in Korea. Uh, Double Show is starting, but with only one detector, and I'll have more about that story in a moment. Daya Bay is due to start really running in a year or two, but uh, one of my friends went over, they're just filling their first detector now, so they're moving, seems like they've taken the pace up, I think maybe pushed a little by Reno. Reno has been the dark horse in Korea without foreign collaborators moving ahead very quietly and claiming they're going to start operating in June. But uh, the aficionados also tell me, ah, well, well, we don't believe it. Well, we'll see. So it's a, it's a, good, it's a good race to watch, and uh, we should see some results from them, initial results, within a year or two. So I'm going to skip over uh, dark matter measurements and so on. Uh, but make one point in favor of neutrino detection is that the direct detection experiments of dark in dark matter only see a scatter. They see a, an elastic scattering, presumably, maybe an inelastic scattering. And they, they don't see what actually scattered. It's going to take us a while to sort it out when we see a signature. And I think everybody here probably has heard the rumors that cogent is seeing some modulation like DAMA, which is certainly going to warm things up, especially since the cogent people were very critical of Dhamma and now seem to be confirming them. So I don't know what to make of that. Uh, so if there is direct detection, then we'll certainly push as hard as we can. We, we will push anyway for the indirect detection, because the indirect detection, you see the, the decay products. And so we could start to learn about what kind of critters these dark matters are. And the hints, by the way, are for around a 10 jav mass for dark matter, not Susie miracle favorite masses up around 100 jav or more, which is also strange. OK, quick tour about the neutrino mass measurement business. Uh, and so Ben is involved in this project here. I got to visit it on a review committee in Karlsruhe this year, this last year. And these. This, the, this works by looking at the distortion at the end of the, new, the decay spectrum in tritium. And it's horrifically hard business, because at the end, there are uh, only 2 times 10 to the minus 13th of all the decays in the last EV. So it's an incredibly high technology thing to pull off to get down to, to less than an EV in neutrino mass. That it's a real high energy physics scale product project. This is 70 meters or so long, and they're building it, and uh, they'll start running it in another year or two. I guess that's all. I cut down the slides on that, but it's to be watched. It's the only game in town for this uh, technique, this very direct detection, except for one thing that uh, I'm not going to talk about, which I presume, Ben, have you given a colloquium here yet? Okay. So if you want to know about a, a tricky new technique that's being pursued, these guys uh, with his friends at MIT in Washington are pursuing that could be a real breakthrough in this business, but it's also going to be very tough. Um, double beta decay is another major activity area in the neutrino business. Uh, two neutrino, neutrino full beta decay has been seen now for, what, 20 years, I guess. Uh, but the neutrino-less double beta decay, which requires uh, some sort of a diagram, which we don't exactly know how to draw, but involves be the neutrinos being uh, Majorana particles, looks like this. But when you measure a rate here that and want to deconvolve it to get some effective mass, you have to take out the matrix element and some other stuff here all of which is hard to calculate and somewhat ambiguous. So I don't want to deal dwell on this again. But there's a big controversy been going on over the years about these matrix elements. Uh, and again, the game here is there's the big neutrino full peak and the little tiny peak from the neutrino-less double beta decay at the end. So you have to have high resolution uh, and very low backgrounds to make this game work. And there's a lot of experiments that are working on it. 
this is a, and, and then even once you've made the measurement, it's not so totally clear what you're actually going to measure because the, uh, this is the minimum neutrino mass and this is the effective mass for a double beta decay. The effective mass for a double beta decay could in fact be way down in here somewhere. So, but there's a lot of people working on this and it's really great to see. I used to go to these conferences over the years, there'd be one report on somebody puttering away with their basement. Now there are big teams really stomping along working on double beta decay all around the world and uh, hopefully they will make some great progress. And in fact, if the Doozle thing goes ahead in South Dakota, several of them will be located there as well as elsewhere. So, the, oh, this was just a slide slipped in to talk about this problem with the uh, flux times cross-section. For This is for experiments around a GEV. There's a long-standing controversy about uh, the interpretation of how do you calculate these fluxes and uh, it involves some details with something called the axial mass that you stick in to do these calculations from the uh, Fermi gas model that everybody employs. It's surely not right anyway, but we don't know anything any better. But there's, there's a problem there, and people generally normalize out about a 30% error in the experiments from the accelerator in the absolute flux, uh, which maybe doesn't count, maybe does. I think I would not take the time to go through this. This was just to show you that Minos has made, has presented some data that shows that there's a difference between new mu bars and new mu's. And all, the only reason I'm showing it is to say don't take it too seriously. But they see it in two channels. One is when they're running with new mu bars directly and they get a solution. This is mixing angle, this is delta m squared here. This is neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. And also, hello, uh, when they do, when they're running with neutrinos, they can also look at the wrong sign muons. And there's a very significant component of anti-neutrinos in the neutrino beam. So you select the wrong sign muons, you can do the anti-neutrino experiment simultaneously if you know what you're doing. They also get a result which is way off from the expected value with that beam. I think there's something a little wrong with the Monte Carlo. The reason I bring this up is not to just badmouth them, but to say in this confusion of funny evidence in the neutrino business going on right now, one thing I wouldn't spend my time worrying about is CPT violation. I don't think I have to convince any theorists. You weren't too worried, were you, Tony, about CPT violation? No, no. <laughs> It would be the opposite if I was trying to sell you CPT violation. <clears throat> Nobody's worried. I'd like to make you worried, but unfortunately. Okay, so now to the reactor neutrino anomaly, which again, this whole thing is a bit dicey. So what I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm not convinced is true, but it might be. Um, it started with our French friends, Thierry Lasserre and company, who were trying to recalculate what the flux of neutrinos, electron antineutrinos, should be from a reactor because their experiment, Double Show, is starting up with only one detector. For political reasons, they can't get their second detector built close to the reactor until 2013. They won't be on the air. So they're trying to say, well, we should go over the old calculations and tune them up and be able to do this theta-1-3 search with just dead reckoning. And they did the calculation, and what they found was not what they wanted to find. They found that the old fluxes needed to be adjusted, and it was going to cause trouble. Um, so I'll show you more about this. So here is distance, and here are the old reactor neutrino experiments. And this is the number observed over the number expected uh, in the new calculation. So this is one up here, their new flux calculation, which gives a larger result. And so the older experiments as a function of distance, which old timers will remember, people like Fred Rhinus and so on, uh, looking for oscillations forever with experiments not too far from reactors, and nobody finding anything. Although Fred, some people may remember the fracas 
uh, around 1980 when Fred and company thought they had something. Anyway, uh, all of these experiments were consistent with the flux being just unchanged as one would expect if nothing is going on uh, as the neutrinos fly away from the reactor for hundreds of meters. So here they are going to operate out here at two kilometers. And so this is what they would see with a modulation due to uh, some value of theta one three. But you see this, this calculation that they've done just totally screws themselves because now if they measure this, we will say, is it theta one three or is it new oscillations? So I tend to give this result a little bit more credibility because they really didn't want to find this result. Um, so here's another way to look at it. They reanalyzed all the data. Some, now I'm not capable to give you a detailed explication of what they did in the calculations. These calculations are very hard for the reactor neutrino flux. You got to know all the damn beta decays in the reactor. That means knowing a lot of isotopes, some significant fraction of which have never been directly observed in the laboratory because they're very short lived. So some experiments have been tried to do some of these things directly, but not very well. There's one by Schreckenbach in 1980 that essentially everything is normalized to, but it has very distinct limitations to it. One of the bigger changes in their results amounted to a couple of percent worth was due to the change in the neutron lifetime over the years. That's been better measured, and there's just no question about that. So nobody argues with that. The rest of it, the experts that I've talked to at Los Alamos and in AEC Canada and so on, and at some of the meetings I've been at recently, no, none of the experts raise any objections to what they've done. They just say, well, systematic errors, who knows? Who knows about systematic errors? But nobody has raised any objections to what they have done, and even the more cynical will say, well, it may be right, but it doesn't have to be right. So. Uh, this is where the, the data is all lined up, and this is where it would be with the new expected fluxes. So now we come on, changing gears a little bit, now to the craziness from the U.S. in uh, Fermilab, in particular in Mini Boon, an experiment made to explicitly check the LSND experiment. To give you scale, LSND was essentially 30 MeV and 30 meters. It's, uh, and this is uh, 300 MeV and 300 meters. So roughly, so with the same L over E, scaling up by about a factor of 10. And slightly different interactions. Uh, so if the LSND thing were right, it should have scaled up. And you should have seen it. And this is the LSND result here and plotted in terms of L over E. And this was the excess that LSND found. There's a long history that I won't go over that made people a little nervous about LS LSND because they first looked at their data, then changed their cuts, and uh, there was a big squabble. They went back and ran again, but they got a confirmation of what they had seen. And uh, so I think the next slide shows this better. The mini boon neutrino mode running in 2009, this was where they should have been seeing something. And uh, they very carefully calculated all these backgrounds. This is, in fact, one of the reasons I hate these blind experiments. Because, in general, what happens if it's a new blind experiment, you open the box and go, oh, what was that? Now we've got to change the cuts and do it over again. It's, uh, and that's, in fact, what they did. Their cuts were here. They opened the box. They said, uh-oh, we don't like this. Well, we don't actually need these lower three bins, so we'll cut those out. But at any rate, if you look for the LSND extrapolated signal, it should have been here, and it, it ain't there. So uh, that's shown in this ratio uh, over here, the excess events, rather, not ratio, excess. So then they went and did anti-neutrino running. And this is the channel in which they did see things at, uh, at Los Alamos. And here, you make the cut, and uh-oh, 
there's an excess. Now I should say that these folks are not stupid. They're not. Uh, these are not hackers. These are high high quality experimentalists. They know what they're doing. They're experienced, and you don't find any mistakes easily that they made. So they've been very careful with all of these backgrounds, and they claim. They like to say these are measured backgrounds, measured by various other techniques. So it's not easy to tell them, oh, well, you just screwed up on one of these backgrounds. That's, it's not trivial. So they claim to see in excess. You see the statistics are not very great. They're in the anti-neutrino running. And if you plot this data versus L over E uh, for the two cases, the mini boon uh, anti-neutrino mode and the LSND, you can say that as a function of L over E, eh, looks more or less the same. But with the neutrino mode, it certainly doesn't look the same, although maybe there's something going on up here. So what to make out of that? People, of course, this sets phenomenologists uh, wild. And with a few extra degrees of freedom, of course, you can fit up an elephant. And uh, Thomas Schwetz and uh, Kopp and Maltoni, for instance, have a nice solution involving three plus two, three standard neutrinos plus two uh, sterile neutrinos. Sterile neutrino being one which does not partake of the normal interactions, but there's a mass state there, and it can be oscillated into and out of. And also invoking CP violation to get the neutrino-anti-neutrino -neutrino difference. So the tooth fairy had to come out. Not, oh, sorry, did I say CPT? CP, yeah, CP. Uh, so they invoke the tooth fairy three times, perhaps. So this was a plot I made to just show where these th different experiments lie on a log energy versus log dis. Oops, that got clipped off. Log distance scale. So this is the solar distance. This is galaxy scale and the end of the universe. And so these lines are constant, uh, constant L over E. And so the ne atmospheric neutrinos and solar neutrinos are being explored by these experiments. So here's LSND. It extrapolated up to the middle of the mini boon range. It was not seen there, but mini boon with the neutrinos sees something funny at the low end. So you start thinking about, gosh, where are we going to check this out? Uh, one place that has, interestingly, a possibility up in the TEV range is Ice Cube, looking for neutrinos coming through the Earth. They're working on that now. Um, what I heard in Madison was that it doesn't look too good for making the measurement for various reasons. But you're going to hear a lot of proposals for people to be able to check this out. So now I need to make a side tour, which I you have to be very quick about. Uh, I, well, I think the last time I gave a talk here was about geoneutrinos. We, we're starting to get into the business of geoneutrinos, and I think it's going to be a whole industry. It's, it's fun. Most of the heating of the Earth presumably comes from uranium-thorium decay chain, and the geologists don't know where the uranium-thorium is, and it really counts what's turning over the mantle and making the geomagnetic field. And we can explore that with neutrinos, and there really isn't any other way. So we've also gotten into the business of remote reactor monitoring. And of course, the uh, various agencies are interested to be able to monitor people's reactors at a distance to see if they're making nuclear uh, weapons material. That requires big detectors, but it has stimulated a lot of people in different countries to start working on the problem. We've done quite a bit. We're working with an agency in Washington that uh, we've been doing studies, and we realize what a great tool neutrinos are for doing this. And if you build a big enough detector to get some spectra, then you can get from one detector, get a range with surprising precision. And if you can do any angular distributions, you can get a very good handle. I'm going to skip over all of this. But we're making pretty maps of how we would locate hidden reactors and so on. Of course, all of those require giant neutrino detectors. You need someone to build a giant neutrino detector, we're, we're, we're yours. Because of course, these detectors can do all the astrophysics and so on that we want to do in particle physics at the same time as looking at the reactors. They're completely unintrusive of each other. 
Uh, so a quick something in a different direction to lead back to what I wanted to introduce about the little neutrino detector. This I talked about, I think, maybe last time here. This idea, which is that people did not realize at first that one could reconstruct charged particle tracks in a liquid scintillator, because scintillators give off light isotropically. But the leading edge of the light field, which I call the Fermat surface, is deterministic. You can't beat Monsieur Fermat, after all. So if you detect that, that surface, then you can reconstruct that track. That's the idea. Lena, which is a proposal for a 50 kiloton detector in Europe, has jumped on this. There's a major white paper on the web as of last Friday. If you want to know, know more about it, I can tell you more about it. But they're able to reconstruct events this way. It works. If you use the whole waveform from the light output in fast phototubes, you can even look at the reaction products. And this is important to this theta 1, 3 business because the background for that in these big experiments is when you have a single gamma produced, uh, sorry, a single pi 0 produced, and an asymmetric uh, decay with a gamma going forward, if you can see the reaction product of the proton or whatever was kicked, uh, and then the shower start 40 centimeters away, you can tell that this was a gamma, not an electron shower. And that's the, sm the biggest background for these theta 1, 3 experiments at the accelerator. So we got the idea to let's use this same idea, the first photons in to do reconstruction in a little tiny neutrino detector doing inverse beta decays. And this we're building in our lab in Hawaii right now and hope to bring it over to San Onofre within the year. And uh, just a few pictures to show you what it looks like. But the idea is that we're using four each of these 64 pixel, very fast, 100 picosecond uh, pixels to uh, cover the, the scintillating block as much as possible. And just a few pictures of it being put together in the lab. And this is a computer simulation to show you something that's rather surprising. Even though the scintillator is only a nanosecond decay time or so, you can reconstruct the trajectory. This is a couple of millimeters long, the trajectory of the positron in this by using this Fermat surface technique. It works much better than I had thought that it would. So the virtues of this is that by having this small size, this is for experts, the problem with the gammas in a big detector like Camland is the gammas shower up and then you can't find the vertex very well. But if you have it small enough, the gammas, gammas from the positron annihilation will escape and you'll just see the positron. That's what we want. You load the plastic up with a neutron absorber and you get the neutron vertex as well. And that's the game to get neutrino directionality. Nobody's done this on an event by event basis with low energy antineutrinos before done it statistically only in, a, in an experiment. Secret is fast timing, a lot of pixels, and so on. Uh, the other thing is that we can eat the noise. That These experiments that people have made, you probably heard a talk by uh, Adam Bernstein from Livermore. No? He's, well, I think he's a yeah, part down here. Yeah. They're t they, so they're down the road here at San Onofre, and they put a detector in San Onofre. But the detector is like so big, but the shielding around it is the size of a VW bus. And But with this detector, we believe we can run without shielding because we can eat the background uh, on the fly. Everything is very, very fast. So the question that's under present study, and the reason that I link it to this, is we've got a detector that can go up quite close to a reactor and eat a lot of background. And if the interpretation of this uh, new result from the French is correct, and it links with the results from Miniboon, and there are some sterile neutrinos which are having a mass difference squared around 1 eV or so, then the, I, I guess I must have lost a slide here somewhere. At any rate, the oscillation is setting in uh, at about two meters or so for four MeV out of the reactor. This means 
by the time you get out four, five, six meters, the oscillations are going to be smeared out. So you're going to have to be in really close, or you'll have to go to somewhat higher energies and further out and with more precision. So you're going to see a lot of proposals about how to check this out to see if it's really true. I don't know whether it's true. I don't even, if you ask me, if David said, how much money will you put on it, I'll say, uh, I'll bet you one beer. That, <laughs> that, but that's all. Uh, it's, I don't know whether it's right or not. But if it is right, then holy moly, it, uh, it, what it's leading to is hard to say. So uh, I, I, I wrote the talk to be kind of a survey of the neutrino business uh, and to convey to people how much is going on in the neutrino business around the world. There's at least 100 neutrino projects going on around the world, and some right here. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, this talk doesn't do justice to all that's going on. But we're having a lot of fun, and uh, the neutrino continues to surprise us. <laughs>